I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for being here. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. Today's program focuses on the book End Papers, which by the way, is available at our local uh, Northshire bookstore and you can purchase that there at the store or online. And um, our two presenters are Steve Sinding and uh, author Alexander Wolf. Steve is familiar to many of you. His um, careers were in international development, population sciences, and public health. He serves on a number of boards and works as an international consultant. He has lectured for GMAL and is a regular moderator for its weekly roundtable discussion group. Alexander Wolf is a journalist, author, and editor. After 36 years as a writer for, the, for Sports Illustrated, he now works out of a converted cow barn in Vermont's Champlain Valley, mostly writing and editing books. He is the author or co-author of seven books about basketball. In March of 2021, Atlantic Monthly Press and Grove UK published End Papers, a family story of books, war, escape, and home with Dumont Buch Verlag of Cologne, releasing a German edition in fall of 2021. He loves to interact with readers, collaborate on events with bookstores, book clubs, libraries, and festivals, and otherwise affirm and spread literary culture. Books are in the family blood, and he enjoys talking with anyone about writing and the writing life, as well as the sweet spot where sports and society overlap. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us today, Alex, and thank you, Steve, for facilitating this discussion. Thank you, Gloria. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Gloria, and thank you all for joining us. It's so nice to see many friends and even a couple of relatives uh, tuning in. Um, Monica and I um, had the uh, delightful opportunity to have lunch with Alex a couple of weeks ago um, at a restaurant midway between Middlebury and Manchester and got to know him uh, in a way that uh, one can't in just the pages of a book. Uh, and discovered among many other things that we shared uh, a period of time growing up in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, uh, a love of basketball, um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in both uh, Monica's in my case and, and uh, Alex's of course, uh, uh, histories of, um, of, of German uh, immigration and refugees. Um, in addition to what um, Gloria has said by way of introduction, I just want to add uh, that the, the book um, is about both um, uh, Alex's grandfather, Kurt Wolf, uh, a very famous and, and accomplished publisher, both in Germany and in this country, and his father uh, and uh, the relationships among them. And I wanted to read just uh, a, a paragraph from the book that I found quite poignant. Uh, and uh, it, I think says a lot about uh, why Alex wrote the book and, uh, and what it meant to him. He says, uh, they had their differences, Kurt and Nico, uh, Nico being um, Alex's father. Uh, they were different after all. Kurt was not a reflective or philosophical person. He was an esthete and very social. Nico, by contrast, would remain content in inner boundlessness, a knack for living in the wings. It would take my father's relocation for the two to reconcile themselves to each other as men in full. As Nico told me in New York, I got to know my father for the first time. If Nico carried a complicated relationship with his father to the United States, my father never foisted that inheritance on me. Our differences rarely led to sustained conflict. For that, we can perhaps credit the hard break of emigration, which ensured that Nico's experience diverged enough from mine to dissolve many potential lines of scrimmage. I love that line. But strangely, here in this country that raised him, I find myself almost regretting the placid quality of our relationship. Nico is the most reticent character in this account. That relative muteness has drawn me closer to him to try to pick a signal out of the historical noise 
so that I might leave for my own son and daughter the accounting Nico never fully left for me. In some ways, I realize it's only after his death that I'm getting to know my father for the first time. So with that by way of introduction, Alex, let me ask you first why you decided to write this book. Well, the, the 36 years I spent, thank you, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for reading that passage. The, the 36 years I spent with Sports Illustrated were spent pretty similarly to the years that my dad spent after he emigrated in 1948 from Germany after the war. Um, just very briefly, he was 12 years, 11 years old when Hitler came to power. Because of a divorce, he's left behind. Um, his his half Jewish dad is on the run. He's considered a culture Bolshevik by the Nazis because of all these these degenerate authors he's publishing. So he's because of the divorce, he's left behind with his entirely non Jewish mother, and then he's on this conveyor belt that takes him to boarding school, Hitler Youth, um, uh, labor service, then conscription, basic training, and he's part of the invasion of the Soviet Union, and. Then in 48, after he's released from an American POW camp, his father has since established himself in New York, Kurt has, and he sends for, for my dad and my dad gets to the States. So I, I see that, um, that, that period and I recognize what my dad did after he arrives in the US in 48 and there's a whole post-war determination to to kind of put your nose to the grindstone and the 50s, the gray flannel suit, conformism, make your way. And my dad has all of this baggage clearly that he's just trying to put behind him. And to, to you know, a much less morally fraught degree, I, during these 36 years with Sports Illustrated, I'm going from assignment to assignment to assignment. And it's enormously exciting and fun and there's travel and great events to be witnessed. Um, but in, in 2016, after the Rio Olympics, I, I realized, okay, I'm, I'm here, I've had this run, there's a, a severance payment waiting for me. Our kids are a, a freshman and a sophomore in high school. Um, now is the time, now, now is the time to maybe take stock. And there's this cache of letters and diaries uh, to explore that I really haven't cracked open. Um, I, I come from a long line of pack rats and letter writers. So all this material is sitting around. So we arranged to go to Berlin for a year. And I honestly didn't know if there was a book to write when we went over there. Um, I suspected with all that material, I could tease something out of it. And then come to find out, I go to archives in Berlin, the German literary archive in Marbach had all sorts of material about my grandfather, including a diary he kept during World War I when he was an officer. Um, and then in the Bundesarchiv in Lichterfelde in Berlin, I discovered things about some of my grandmother, my dad's mother's side of the family and um, things that they were implicated in. And very quickly, I realized that there is a story about a fractured family, um, a story basically where my dad fought for the Nazis and his dad fled them. And being in Berlin, being a journalist by vocation and seeing what was going on politically in Germany under Angela Merkel, and what was starting to happen in the US. Um, arriving in Berlin and four days after we arrived, Charlottesville happens. I start taking notes as a journalist would take notes. So yes, there's memoir. Yes, there's history. But there's also journalism folded into this into this sort of three way stew that, that I ultimately come up with. But it, it was a little bit of a midlife crisis, Steve, I think, it, you know, to circle back to your question, why? Um, Crisis might be too strong a word, maybe midlife curiosity or midlife taking up unfinished business. And um, and again, I didn't go over there knowing, I didn't have a book contract. I didn't know that there was a story. I just said, okay, I'm gonna be curious and I have the time and my wife is getting involved volunteering with refugees. Uh, our kids are having this magnificent experience at an international school and this lively, city where all sorts of fascinating stuff is happening. And here I had my project and it took me another year or so to make sense of it even after we got home. Um, but Berlin kind of brought it to life. It kindled it to life. Good. Um, 
tell us a little bit about how you went about researching the book uh, while you were in Berlin. So I, I did know the rough contours of the story. I mean, I knew about my grandfather and his career and he'd grown up in Bonn in a musical family. His mother was the ancestor who, or, or the side of the family where the ancestors were of Jewish descent. Um, and then he, he just had this passion for books and he inherited a lot of money from his mother's ancestors and was able to start um, before World War I, a very successful publishing house in Leipzig. Um, so I knew that and I knew he, everything changed after World War I as everything in Germany did change and suddenly an appetite for the kinds of books that my grandfather published disappeared and then the Nazis came along and there was a hyperinflation and then he flees and goes on the run. And I knew my dad because of the divorce left behind with his mom and so forth. So I, I knew that split, the sort of fracture in the family. Um, but I have a lot of cousins over there and they're great storytellers. They're, they're archivists and pack rats in their own right. So I doorstepped them. I got them to tell me stories. And then taking advantage of the fastidiousness of, of Germans, um, these archives have just phenomenal things in them. And my German was just good enough so I could identify a document that might merit further exploration. Um, I'd order up a photocopy in the archive and walk out with a photocopy and then try to make sense of it. And then I found a woman in my neighborhood, an American woman who was ABD history, all but dissertation in history. And she was teaching Americans German. So she's fluent in German, really understood the history. And she helped me workshop these really crude translations I would do of family letters, um, diary entries like that World War I diary that was in the archive in Marbach. Um, and it, it was almost like sitting in a dark room and seeing a, a photographic paper, you know, just kind of an image clarifies in, in the in the bath. And um, I would say within three or four months, um, I realized I had something and the most powerful stuff. So I'm I'm going through these family records, letters and diary entries and so forth. And in parallel, I'm reading the history. I'm not ABD in history. I majored in history, but only have a BA in it and really was more taken up by American history. So I'm reading narrative histories of the invasion of the Soviet Union, of the history of German Jewry. I'm reading memoirs by Gunter Grass and uh, Jochen Fest and um, things that illuminate that time. Um, this magisterial work of history by Timothy Snyder called Bloodlands about Ukraine and Poland and, and the Western Soviet Union as, as Hitler and Stalin were sort of passing it back and forth. And, and I think it was in the toggling back and forth between the great sweeping histories um, those secondary sources and then the primary source stuff, which were these letters and diary entries, which were very personal and intimate, that's where the story kind of surfaced. So one of the things that you uh, delved into while you were in Europe was uh, the Merck side of your family. Your father's, your grandfather's uh, first wife was uh, Elizabeth Merck uh, of the pharmaceutical family. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, that relationship, uh, that family, and uh, your feelings about um, your relationship to it. So there, there's a there's a kind of um, virtue in my grandfather, you know, fighting the good fight for literature and uh, being what what the Germans call a Gesinnungsemigrant, somebody who went fled, went into exile out of conviction, essentially. Um, within 48 hours of the Reichstag burning in, in 1933, he turns to my step-grandmother and says, these are madmen, pack, and they lit out for London, and eventually they make it to France and Italy and back to Vichy, France, where they have to get out. Um, but yes, my grandmother's family, my dad's mom, whom he's living with, who remarries, uh, an actually her own obstetrician becomes her husband, her second husband, is this Darmstadt-based pharmaceutical and chemical company held in the family since the 17th century. They pioneered um, a drug called Oikidol, which is basically a forerunner of the, the op opioid um, 
that we know today as oxycodone um, and cocaine. I mean, cocaine, legitimate cocaine was distributed around the world as Merck cocaine. It was the Cadillac of cocaines. And, um, you know, I'd always known this connection to the family. And those of you who know the Merck uh, company in the United States, that was a distant ancestor who emigrated in the late 19th century and set this up. And when World War I came along and the Trading with the en Enemy Act was enacted by Congress, um, Merck in, in Darmstadt had to be expatriated. Um, I'm sorry, Merck Darmstadt had to give up Merck Rawway, which was the US um, version of it. And um, the, the most disturbing thing I discover in in Germany, while modern Merck, the Merck after um, the Bundesrepublik is formed in 1948 or 49, has been a model corporate citizen in many respects, uh, certainly not behaving like the Sacklers. Um, there was this chapter during the war, come to find out, in a history that Merck itself commissioned as part of its 350th anniversary, uh, where it turns out they were much more involved in the Nazi war effort than they had ever let on. And um, also some of these drugs that they produced, including Oikodal and, and the cocaine that they produced were actually used by Hitler. Um, after the abortive assassination attempt on Hitler's life, um, he had a ruptured eardrum that caused him enormous pain and um, Oikodal was also used just to kind of st steady his nerves and, and keep him up for the fight. So there's this entire area of kind of moral reckoning that was introduced to me when I learned in reading a book called Blitzed, which has been published in the States and some of you might be familiar with that, um, how drugs were involved in the whole Nazi um, war effort. And, and Hitler was actually kind of propped up, certainly in the, in the final months of the war and when he was in the, the bunker and deluded and paranoid. Um, there's plenty of evidence that the delusions and paranoia were were exacerbated by these drugs that my my ancestors produced and and profited on and you know let's be fair my dad had some of that wealth even after he emigrated and and i went off to college and summer camp and um, that wealth has stayed in the family so it, it there are a lot of touch points of complicity that that i i came upon i mean i suppose it's not a merc thing specifically but the most disturbing um, thing I learned was that I described that two track process where I'm toggling between these histories and the letters that my family members wrote. So my dad's writing these letters home to his mother in Munich during the war in which he's talking about how well he and his fellow soldiers are eating as they're invading Ukraine and Poland and Western Soviet Union. And I don't know about many of you here on the Zoom, but I paid attention when I was taking history in high school and a number of courses in college. And my understanding of the Holocaust was that it essentially took place in camps, death camps in the Polish woods. Um, but in fact, come to find out from Bloodlands and a few other sources, the Nazis had this sinister plan for that part of Europe, the Bloodlands, which was to intentionally starve Slavs, Jews and Soviet prisoners by diverting food so the soldiers would live off the land and any excess would go back to the home front to keep civilians fat and happy. And the starvation of all these people in the East was by design. So it, when my dad is writing letters home and every other letter is full of him reassuring his mother, we have plenty to eat. The other night we had fried potatoes. We have Portuguese sardines and olive oil. Don't worry about me. We buy all this bread for for Fennigs on the on the, the, the Deutschmark. Um, and that was part of the deviousness too, because they were spending Reichsmarks in in a in a place where the Reichsmark was was uh, incredibly powerful currency. And to see just how easily a soldier of the Wehrmacht, you know, who's not doing duty, he's not rounding up Jews, he's not doing duty in a, in, in a gas chamber. But simply eating his rations is complicit in, in a kind of genocide. I mean, that to me was probably the most disturbing thing. Oh. Alex, tell us uh, a little bit about your grandfather's um, 
uh, career in uh, in Germany be before he had to flee, uh, and um, how he founded Pantheon and uh, his, his American uh, rebirth as a publisher. Yeah, it's really, it's a remarkable story of, of boom in Boston, boom again. Um, so he, he's born in 1887 in Bonn. And, and becomes, I mean, he, he, he must have suffered from some kind of OCD because he was just this passionate collector of, of art, but, but primarily books, including old, old incunabula from the very early days of the printing press. And um, he, he thinks he maybe wants to get a PhD, but it's clear that he doesn't really have the academic chops for it. And he's very social and um, publishing and kind of pressing things he has enthusiasm for on other people is very much part of his personality. So he winds up in Leipzig, which is the center of the German publishing industry before World War I. And he's young, he's in his early to mid twenties and the Kaiser is getting kind of old. And, and the whole idea of Imperial Germany is, is yesterday's news. And there are these very, very exciting, many expressionist writers around him. He hires Franz Werfel, the, the Austrian writer, as a reader for his publishing house. Um, one day, a guy from Prague named Max Brod comes into the office with Franz Kafka, who's his protege. And uh, Kurt, my grandfather, has read a few things by Kafka, is fascinated by the guy, and he becomes Kafka's publisher. Uh, Heinrich Mann, uh, during World War I actually writes this anti-Kaiser uh, book called Der Untertan, which is all a send up of the ridiculousness of Imperial Germany, uh, which earned him death threats. But as soon as Kurt got back, he said, as soon as the war's over, censorship is gone. We're going to publish this thing. We're going to blow it out. Um, and unfortunately, the, the hyperinflation of the 20s and the Weimar era uh, did him in. The public's taste changed so much. So and then the Nazis come to power. So the idea of publishing is completely out of the question. So for the next 10 to 12 years, he is first in France, then in Italy, then one step ahead of the posse back to France. And in 41, um, through the help of somebody named Varian Fry, who is an idealistic American, who was trying to get cultural figures out of occupied France, um, he's able to go through Lisbon to New York. And then within a year, somehow founds Pantheon Books, which of course still exists, but at the time was very high-minded, published a lot of literature and translation. They did a, a version of Grimm's fairy tales right out of the bat while World War II was going on. And uh, there were a lot of people who on principle didn't want to read anything German for good reason, uh, but it became a, a pretty good holiday bestseller. And uh, then they publish uh, Gift from the Sea by Anne Lindbergh and uh, Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago was their big breakthrough book. But then there's this boardroom coup that happens because suddenly there's a lot of money involved in Pantheon books. It's not this quaint, you know, uh, something for your personal prestige on your coffee table to impress your friends or a publisher. It's, there's money to be made. So he gets forced out, retreats in defeat to Switzerland only in 1961 to be visited by Billy Ivanovich, who had become the CEO of Harcourt Brace and World, and is invited to come and publish an imprint under him. So you can see kind of multiple boom and bust. And then just before he gets struck by a, a truck that was backing up that killed him during a visit to Germany in 1963, he did have about a year and a half, two years of kind of vindication where he was once again uh, astride the American publishing industry. So you've told us about your father's um, service as a soldier in the Wehrmacht uh, and how he got to this country. Um, but he chose uh, a, a career in science. Um, the son of a, of, a, of a famous publisher and who was himself uh, from a family of humanists and, and, and artists. Why do you think your father turned to science and away from uh, the family legacy? That's a great question. I know he wanted to be an architect um, and architecture is kind of your classic merging of art and science. Um, and then 
he's on the Russian front and he sees uh, a notice posted in the barracks that says that there are openings back in Munich at the Institute of Technology to study chemistry. And anybody, any soldier who wants to apply for a leave is welcome to do so. So he saw this as his chance to leave the front. So he applies and he gets this five month study leave. And this would have been about 42, maybe early 43. And as soon as it ends, he gets called back up um, and is now thrown onto the Western Front because that's where the needs are most emergent for the Nazis. Um, and he ultimately gets captured by the Americans. Of course, the counterfactual case is he gets captured by the Soviets and his fate is probably a whole lot grimmer if he winds up in the Gulag. Um, as his first cousin did and didn't get back to Germany until two, three years after the war ended. Um, but my dad was just cut from a different cloth. I mean, he, I think, identified more with the Merck side of the family, chemistry. Um, his favorite uncle was a race car driver. He was also a member of the SS, I came to find out. Um, not something that was ever discussed in my family. Um, he didn't wear a black uniform. The regime decided that this great uncle of mine would be more valuable on the factory floor in Darmstadt during the war. Um, but that was something really sobering to learn that my dad's favorite uncle was in the SS, that my dad's stepfather, whom he adored, while he wasn't a party member, he donated to this auxiliary group to the SS that a lot of professional people like a doctor like him or a lawyer would do to sort of stay in good, the good graces of the regime. Um, but as far as my dad was concerned, this was a little bit of an exit strategy. The, um, the exigency of getting a chance to go back to Munich and study in the middle of the war, it just scrambled his destiny enough that he wound up getting captured by the Americans who treated him pretty well. Um, he came down with an infection, they put him in a hospital. Uh, the soldier who processed him after he was captured found that he had a Leica camera and insisted on compensating my dad. Said, this guy said, it was a GI from Chicago who said, I have to take this from you, but I wanna give you something for it. And he gave him a carton of cigarettes, which my dad was able to use in barter to make his life easier in the camp. How did he get to this country? So the war ends, he gets processed through Heilbronn and just shows up back in Munich at my grandmother's house one August day. And she's mortified. He has dysentery. He's about 140 pounds and um, he sleeps a lot. There's very little food to be had, but he uh, actually took a camera over to the PX for the local American forces and would tell GIs that he'd be happy to take photographs of, of them that they could then send home to their families. And in exchange, they would take things from the PX and give them to him and he'd bring them back and his mother and he could could eat. Um, so he's in touch finally after the war ends with Court, who's become an American citizen in the interim. Remember, he's got there in 41. He's founded Pantheon. And while Pantheon is definitely on a shoestring, um, my dad's father and stepmother are doing fairly well. And they send things over and, and Court says, you know, study your English. My dad listens to Armed Forces Network Radio, Luncheon and Munchin, the jazz show and his English improves. And he finally gets a student visa to go to Princeton to study chemistry and arrives in 48 of Friday the 13th. And those of you who've looked at the calendar last week know that we just had an August 13th. That was a Friday the 13th. And you can imagine, I thought of my dad stepping off that, that boat, uh, the SS Ernie Pyle. Um, and uh, yeah, very quickly he, he turned himself into an immigrant striver um, and was always struck at how people, and maybe it was just a function of the times, they weren't demanding to know the details of his past. You know, he was just another person trying to make it in the American post-war. In that passage I read, um, you, you talk about your own relationship with your father um, and say very little uh, in the book, actually, about conversations you and he had about his life before America. Uh, did he talk much about his youth or did he talk at all about the war? He did. I, I want to be fair to my dad and, and shoulder the responsibility for this as much as I should. 
So my dad never dodged questions. I just didn't ask a lot of questions. But I do remember when I was young, you know, there, there'd be no joining the Boy Scouts. No son of his was going to put on a uniform and take an oath. You know, he'd been in the Hitler Youth and he knew that you don't do that to children, that that's just not done. And um, so I could see the trauma a little bit in the way he reacted to that. Um, he told a story from being a prisoner of war about another German prisoner who was caught stealing chocolate from guards and was fed nothing but chocolate until his prisoner died. Um, so there were there were war stories, but they were all kind of framed by, you know, what happened was horrible. It should never happen again. Um, do what you can to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, but I just didn't ask the questions. And there was this kind of tacit understanding between us that we were both trying to make our way. And the one time that we really talked about it was in 96. And I devote a chapter in the book to this cruise we took down the Danube. Um, it was about nine or 10 days that we were on this uh, bespoke built tourist boat that they run between Nuremberg and, and Budapest. And I took notes, notes that proved to be really valuable when I went to Berlin on the project. And um, he answered questions as I, I threw them at him as best he could. And I, of course, have all sorts of questions I wish I could ask him today in light of all the research I was able to do. Yeah. And he did, to be fair, again, he, I would say about five years before he died for my sisters and me, he took all those letters he sent home during the war from the front um, that his mother had saved, everyone put in a shoebox, and he translated them and privately published them for us. Um, and that was a huge help. And I think he, he wanted us to know he wasn't trying to hide this part of his life. Um, but of course, the number one question I would ask him would be, did you know about the hunger plan? I and mean, when you were eating so well in the Ukraine, when you tell me about your Ukrainian girlfriend and how you used to go for walks along the Dnieper River with her and you would have picnics together and sometimes you would give her food to share with her family. When I, when I remember him telling me that, that giving her food to share with her family, I'm beginning to suspect that he does know uh, that there's starvation, certainly in the countryside, and it must have kind of rippled into the city where he was billeted. As you researched the book and lived in Berlin, did your perceptions or your attitudes about Germans changed in any way? I was really struck. I mean, I'd heard this and I'd read about it in newspaper stories and so forth, that the Germans have this rigorous way of approaching public memory, um, historical memory, and they put great thought and consideration into, into monuments. Um, th th this great German word for monument is Denkmal, which is literally means um, think for a moment or think, think once. Um, and so I knew that there, that this is something that they gave consideration to, you know, how, how are we going to, remember the past, but it was really, I think, reinforced by walking around the city because Berlin is this kind of history just oozes from, from every building, but um, doing a lot of the parallel reading about some of the debates about historiography and um, how are we going to memorialize the Holocaust? Well, we're gonna put uh, multi-acre installation in the center of our capital and it will be um it will be criticized by the political right for for being a monument of shame but that's what we have an obligation to do because it's a shameful part of our history and to read some of the speeches given by german presidents not the chancellors not the angela merkels or the, or the helmut schmitz but the presidents who are very ceremonial and they're kind of the philosopher kings of germany um, when the day in May comes around that uh, the war in Europe ended, there was a famous speech given in, in 1985 by a German president who said, this was not a day of defeat. This was a day of liberation. We were liberated from uh, national socialism on that day, and we should celebrate that. Um, that is such an interesting framing of it all. And it made a huge impression on me. And I, I had a very hard time 
processing all that without thinking about being an American and particularly at a time we're going through a very fraught reckoning with our own racial history and just how far behind the Germans we are in grappling and memorializing that and thinking about Washington DC and how only recently have there been uh, think the equivalent of these Holocaust memorials um, that are in Germany that speak to our history of racial injustice and slavery and, and Jim Crow. So it was, I learned a lot um, and it was, it was that delta between what I knew going in and, and what I took home with me, I think was really where I, I developed a, a real admiration for modern Germany. Um, and, and certainly this process has accelerated as that generation that was so silent, that was still implicated in the, in the Nazi era has died off. How did your children uh, react to the year in Germany? And um, have, have they become more interested in your family history as a consequence of that? Uh, or were they too young to develop that kind of a uh, historical interest? They're, they're interested, they're both, um, one is gonna be a sophomore in college, the other is going off for her freshman year. And they're, they're both taking or going to take German, which, which is really cheered me. I think they, the fact that they're gonna have the passport, that they've met a lot of their cousins of their own age, um, is a big driving part of that. They both kind of started reading the book, but, and there are episodes in it that we've talked about at the, the living room table, uh, the dining room table. Um, during the pandemic, sometimes it's the living room table. Um, but I, I, I know that there are going to be conversations in our future uh, about a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think it's going to be a matter, as they study German more, the great thing is you progress through language study. Those of you who studied languages know this. Uh, culture gets folded in because you have to read, write, and speak about certain things. And why not it be about the country of your target language? So um, they're going to start engaging with a lot of these issues that I've ventilated in the book. And my daughter, when we were in London in 2012, and she was only nine years old, um, we were visiting the cabinet war rooms in London where Churchill had directed Britain's response to the Blitz and, you know, taking them there, we had to explain what the Blitz was and who the Nazis were and what they were trying to do to the rest of Europe. And of course, I wasn't going to let that moment pass without explaining, you know, your Opa grew up in Germany and had to wear the swastika when he served in the Wehrmacht. And I'll never forget my daughter saying at age nine, isn't there some way Opa couldn't have been a spy? Uh, and, and I was kind of floored by that. And circling back to your very first question, why I came to write the book, um, there was a little bit of wanting to answer that question, wanting to answer Clara's question about what could my dad have done? You know, what agency did he have? And um, I didn't fully come away with a satisfactory answer. But as I, as I say to her through the course of the preface of the book, you know, I hope maybe in reading this book, you're going to get a better understanding of what it was he, he did go through. So how did you become a sports writer? How um, would your grandfather have felt about that? <laughs> yeah, no, I come from a family where um, there's very little interest or aptitude in sports. Um, I think it might have been my own little act of rebellion in the same way that my dad went the STEM route because his dad couldn't change a tire. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted maybe to put behind me my ill at ease immigrant dad and, and just kind of fit in with all the kids in the neighborhood who were, uh, playing baseball and, and shooting hoops. And, um, it was a way to find my people, I suppose, as a participant. And then in college, it was a way to make a little spending money, become a stringer. Um, one of the things that Steve and I discovered when we had lunch the other day was that we both sent in sports scores to the Trenton Times in Trenton, New Jersey at, at various points in our life. Actually, there's a very similar point in our life, um, but at different times. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a way to find my niche. And then 
a chance. I, I was so lucky to land early in my career as a journalist at Sports Illustrated, where really the golden age of that magazine, the Timec magazines had the budgets to really underwrite ambitious journalism. And at, at SI, we we did um, sports stories, but they frequently had a twist that was well beyond sports. And that made it very gratifying stuff. You talk about um, people that your grandfather published, famous names like uh, Kafka. Um, did you discover anything about his relationships with his authors, uh, how he found them or how he worked with them, how he dealt with them, how they felt about him? Yeah, there, there actually, there's a lot of rich material about that. I'm the, I didn't go too far down some of those rabbit holes because the, that would have been a little bit uh, or piece from the main narrative, but, um, Kafka particularly, because his relationship with Kafka was kind of echoed the way he abandoned his his son and, and my aunt. You know, he I don't fault him for this because he and, and his second wife and their son uh, were under real threat and they had to sneak out. Um, and at the time they left in 41, there was no way to tell that Nazi Germany was going to going to fall and my dad's mother, whom he was living with, uh, was certainly very privileged and prosperous. So that was a little more complicated. But Kafka and Kurt had this relationship where Kafka was constantly doubting himself. Kurt recognized this about his personality and sent in, in these letters. And that's the beauty of it. The letters all survive. I mean, they've been published, Kafka's collection of letters and then Kurt has a collection of letters, so you can find them everywhere. Um, so he's constantly boosting Kafka's morale and saying, oh, but Herr Dr. Kafka, um, you know, these aren't trifles that you're writing. The, the, these aren't things that should be burned upon your death, and, and we will publish you in the most respectful way possible. And he did. He really did. But there is a point at which he says, um, you know, Kafka wants to move to Berlin. He wants to get married. Um, He's concerned about his material well-being, and uh, Kurt assures him in a letter and says, "Don't worry, we'll take care of all the details." Um, and the great Kafka, Kafka biographer Reiner Stock points out that this was a completely irresponsible promise on my grandfather's part. Um, so in the book, I, I I kind of mine that letter and apply it um, as responsibly as I think I could to the way he. Uh, maybe wasn't always there for my dad and my, and my aunt. Um, so there are all sorts of fascinating things in these human relationships. I mean, the, the relationship between a book publisher uh, slash editor and a writer is is almost a romantic one. I mean, the, the, the trust that has to be there. And um, But Kurt was pretty good about letting go if if an author felt for whatever reason that he or she needed to go elsewhere. He wasn't possessive that way. He felt that they it really had to be a relationship of mutual commitment. Um, you are pretty frank in the book in talking about his extramarital adventures. Um, how'd you find out about those? And uh, how much do you know about them? And how do you feel about them? You know, that, that was one of the things my dad didn't talk about extensively. My mom would occasionally talk to me about it, kind of as a means to maybe explain my dad a little bit, who was a very devoted husband. Um, and conversely, my German cousins did nothing but talk about it. This is the whole American-European dichotomy when it comes to adultery, I suppose. Um, they talked openly about it, these cousins. and. Um, and, and indeed stayed in touch with the illegitimate son that Kurt had fathered as if he were just another cousin, um, which is very noble in many ways, I think. Um, one of the things I did when I got over to Europe was I chased down the daughter of this illegitimate son. Um, she is alive, lives on an island off the northeast coast of Denmark and was delighted to receive me there for a couple of days. And we had fascinating conversations. Um, 
And I found a lot of letters too, letters that um, alluded to this illegitimate son named Enoch and um, letters that also illuminated the relationship that they had. And Kurt tried to have a relationship with him, but it was a very fitful one as imperfect a dad as he was to my father and my aunt. He was even more lacking in the way he, he, he tried to be a, a father to this illegitimate son of his. So he was a, he was a complicated man. Um, at one point, I, I say that my grandfather was the morally murkier man, but my father was condemned to walk the morally murkier uh, path, as it were, which, which is probably an oversimplification, but there is that way that they diverged. Um, and I do think a lot of my dad's life he was just trying to construct a normal life for himself, for my mom and for us. And that meant, you know, two parents, uh, he was gonna wear his gray flannel suit through the 50s and 60s and go off and earn a paycheck. And uh, he didn't wanna talk about these things that had to do with, uh, you know, Merck drugs to which a lot of my ancestors became addicted. Um, you know, all these all these things that became kind of sacraments of the 60s. You can see my dad raising an eyebrow of, of skepticism. And I definitely got that message from him. Was your grandfather a better uh, father uh, to um, your father's half brother, Christian? Uh, and uh, And what became of him? Well, Christian is a retired Dartmouth professor of music, comp lit, and classics. Um, he lives in Royalton, Vermont, on a farm. And if non-COVID times, he travels around the world um, performing pieces that he composes. He's a fairly well-known avant-garde composer who very quickly in New York, um, when they move there, just gets up in the caught up in this whole experimental music scene and, and makes a, a full life for himself. And I think he had a much different relationship to Kurt because it was a stable one. Kurt's older and he's, his health is compromised enough. He's not running off anywhere. You know, he's, he, he's fairly stable in the sense that he's going to be around. But I think Christian was restless and was always looking for something, something else different. Um, but yeah, my, my dad and aunt's relationship to, um, to Kurt, was in a whole separate category. And I think my aunt particularly was the one who had the, the most difficult time with it because they were alike. They were both very artistic. She was older. I think she really felt the abandonment because she never left Europe. So Kurt and Helen flee in 41, literally at the time that Maria has just had a, a baby and is about to be bombed out of her apartment in Freiburg, Germany with her husband off fighting in the war. Um, and there is at the very center of the book, a very emotional exchange of letters between Kurt and Maria, where Maria writes desperately trying to get her father's attention and affection and understanding of what it is that they've gone through. She writes in this letter describing what it's been like, what a typical bombing raid is like. And she despairs at the end of this letter that people like Thomas Mann are saying all Germans are covered in blood and shame. And she says, how can he say that? He wasn't here. You know, we were victims too. And, and Kurt writes this letter back to her that, that is very, very stern. Um, certainly concedes that she's gone through a lot of suffering, but explains that a boomerang came from Germany and came back and hit Germany. And Germans alone are responsible for that. And they are indeed covered in blood and shame. And that he, Kurt Wolf, does not exempt himself because he too is German, and there were things he could have done to to stop this um, before it became what it became. I'm I've just started reading um, Louis Menand's book, The Free World, which is kind of an intellectual history of the United States from 1944 to 1964, in which he talks about how uh, World War II and its aftermath shaped. Um, uh, intellectual thought and the arts in the United States. It's, it's actually a fascinating book and I, I do recommend it to any of you. When you're at the Northshire buying, <laughs> buying end papers, uh, you might look uh, also uh, at Louis Menand's book. He mentions Christian 
uh, Christian and, and Kurt both appear uh, in the book as, uh, as, as significant figures in that story. Well, I, I, I do want to share one anecdote. I mean, this is in a footnote in the book. This is one of the many rabbit holes I went down. But as long as you're bringing that up, Steve, I, I, I think people on the Zoom might appreciate this. So Christian becomes interested in music and thinks he wants to be a pianist, but then starts going to piano lessons with things he's written and shows them to his piano teacher. And she says, I can't help you with this. You know, you really need to see somebody who's a composer. Um, the guy who lives right above me in, in this apartment building is a guy named Merce Cunningham, who's an avant-garde dancer and happens to have a friend named John Cage. So maybe John Cage would be willing to take you on as a student. So sure enough, Cage is fascinated by what Christian wants to write, but Christian's parents can't afford to pay him for the lessons because they have no money. They've just started Pantheon and they've agreed not to take a salary until Pantheon breaks into the, into the black. So instead of bringing over a check or cash to pay for his lessons, Kurt and Helen hand Christian a copy of Pantheon's latest books. And he went over there with uh, books about uh, uh, Eastern uh, mythology, uh, Alan Watts, Joseph Campbell, the I Ching, uh, published by Pantheon in conjunction with Bollingen Foundation. And these things become part of what shapes John Cage's entire aesthetic. So the impecuniousness of this refugee family indirectly is, is creating the art of this avant-garde genius, John Cage, which is to me one of the lovely little uh, bizarre happenstances of, of that 20 year period that Louis Menand is so devoted to. Yeah, and and that all that whole story kind of appears in in the Louis Menon book, which is uh, fun fun. It was fun for me having just read End Papers to uh, discover that uh, continuing in the other in the other book. Um, Alex, we've uh, kind of run out of my questions, and we've run for an hour, and I would like to open it up. Uh, to questions from uh, people on the chat, uh, I see that there's one already in the chat. But just before we do that, let me ask if there's anything I haven't asked you that you wish I had asked you that, or anything you'd like to add uh, to uh, this fascinating story you've already told us before we turn to the audience. No, I, 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 I you've, you've really asked a great array of questions. I mean, I, I know the very simplistic way of touting the book is, um, a grandfather who fled the Nazis and a father who fought for them, which was almost verbatim the subhead on the review in the New York Review of Books. And while that's that's true, it's technically true, um, the book has a lot more nuance and, and ebb and flow and gray and um, to it, as actually you might intuit from that those two poles there. But um, yeah. I, I just, I, I, I will say only that um, people are finding their way to this book and into this book in a lot of different ways. And it, it ceases to amaze me. I'll get emails over the transom um, from people. And, and there's some organizing themes to the way they're reacting to it, but um, it really is interesting between what we're going through right now as a country and the sort of political moment, um, a lot of, German Americans, German German Americans with Jewish background and not with Jewish background. Um, it, it's it's really been interesting, and I um, if people are intrigued and do find their way to the book, I'd love to to find out how it was you you engaged with it, what it was that most drew you in, if if anything. <laughs> I guess that's my plea. Okay, good. Uh, let me turn it over to Gloria then. Uh, for uh, uh, things that may be appearing in the chat, and also to call on people from the audience who uh, who may want to say something, uh, raise your hands if you'd uh, if you'd like to be recognized. Go ahead, Gloria. So, so I just want to thank thank you both. Uh, this was um, very moving, um, and 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 the uh, conversation back and forth was just just really enlightening. So thank thank you both for doing that. 
Um, we have a question from Ann Graham. She wants to know uh, what your relationship with your editor was like for this book and what did he or she bring to the project? I love, I love process questions. That actually is how I should have answered Steve's last open ended question. Um, so my editor, uh, the, the house I, I was published by is a house that my uh, grandfather and step grandmother would raise a glass to it. Grove Atlantic is both Grove Press, which does a lot of literature, has a great backlist list, and also Atlantic Monthly Press, um, which does terrific narrative nonfiction. And they're kind of a boutique house, so they um, punch above their weight a little bit. Um, and you don't get lost. There's not a conveyor belt that's pushing books out. And I was assigned to an editor named Peter Blackstock, 29 year old Brit, fluent in about five or six languages, including Russian and German. And you probably would recognize Peter's work more from um, some of the fiction he's edited because he had the last two Booker Prize winners, um, Shuggy Bain, the, the Douglas Stewart novel, and the one before that uh, by Bernardine Evaristo. So he has um, a real, real knack for finding stuff. Um, he didn't find me. <laughs> um, the book was bought by Morgan Entrican, who's the publisher at the house, but he was a wonderful uh, collaborator, really um, sensitive, um, devil's advocate uh, as an editor. And editors and publishers are two different things. Editors are really in the trenches and going line to line and um, publishers are kind of the big picture people and are, are probably more social and, and uh, more averse to the trenches. Um, in fact, there's a place in end papers where Kurt uh, is upset that he's been consigned to, to some sort of role of editor at Pantheon and is very offended by this because he's always been a publisher. He sees himself as this holistic book person. But Peter was the guy that I got to to get into the niggling details with and um, has been so much fun. And his understanding of German and Germany uh, was like this big plush safety net. Um, for me as I worked on this because my German really is is pretty substandard and I needed all the help I could get in that regard. Okay. Um, um, if anybody would like to ask a question without typing it in the chat feature, you're welcome to raise your hand and, and, and um, I will call on you. Um, Bill Friedman. Okay. Yes. All right. First of all, thanks very much to both of you. Very interesting conversation. Um, I live in Israel, <clears throat> and I've worked for 20 years as a volunteer for an organization that supports uh, Holocaust survivors in Israel, houses them, feeds them, and everything else. Uh, so I'm kind of obsessed with one aspect of your story, and that is your father and the Wehrmacht, and the question of, you know, his feelings about it, what this did to him. I guess I'm mainly concerned with the question of guilt and remorse. Now, I don't want to be tactless here, although I can be, because I'm quite passionate about this, And but I, I don't want you to feel that I'm attacking him or you. Um, but it doesn't sound to me like your father was truly remorseful. It doesn't seem to have been a significant emotional part of his life that he had participated in this horror. He seems to have dealt with it cerebrally. Yes, it was a terrible thing. You shouldn't do it again. Don't be a Boy Scout. And uh, this should never be allowed to happen again. But you know, we are visited frequently. In fact, our major donors are Germans. Yes, uh, some of whom are, are you know, from that period and some of the children of people from that period. Uh, by far, the major portion of our money comes from guilty Germans, you might say, from a German church in Bieselberg and from a place called the Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, which uh, was run, the head of which is a German. Um, and so I have met the best of Germans, uh, a wonderful, wonderful people. And indeed, they have done a reckoning that others, you know, in Hungary, Poland, etc., have not done. It's also true that many of them still feel that they are the true victims. I, I mean, I happen to be reading Susan Nyman's book, What We Can Learn from the Germans. Um, anyway, um, 
So that when we get visited by Germans, uh, like we were visited about a year ago by a prominent politician whose name I don't remember, he was uh, a major figure. He couldn't stop apologizing to the audience, yes, of Holocaust survivors. He just, uh, he was just over, overwhelmed emotionally with the fact that he was talking to Hunger. And he, he said, I know where I come from and you know, what I represent and all of this sort. Anyway, I'm wondering really, to what extent do you feel that your father did carry some of this with him or that he managed to put it away primarily? There, there's so many aspects to, to your question and comment, Bill, that, um, that I could take up. I mean, my, my dad um, was in the Wehrmacht and I did not know this, um, and most Germans did not know this um, until recently, which is that the Wehrmacht actually were collaborators. It wasn't just the SS or the Einsatzgruppen and so forth who were on the ground responsible for the Holocaust, but there were Wehrmacht units that were conscripted into it too. And I tried to determine whether my dad was indeed um, involved. And as best as I can tell, uh, the atrocities I've been able to identify that took place in the Ukraine when he was there, he was somewhere else when they took place. Um, your, your supposition about my dad's posture and where on some scale of remorse he might fall, I think is probably for the most part on the money and that the one window I have into that is that when I was about 17, we were in Munich and I mentioned this in the book, um, we were in Munich as a family and a friend of mine came up from Switzerland and the two of us wanted to go out to Dachau the next day. And I mentioned to my dad that we were going to do that. And my dad's response was, why would you want to do that? And I felt a, a, a stab in my heart when I heard that from him because it, it wasn't what a 17 year old son of someone who had worn a swastika on a uniform during the 40s. That's, that's not what I should hear from him. And I think I understand where he had landed and why that was his response. He had tried to put this all behind him. He wanted to protect us from that. But in my wish to go to Dachau, um, I think I was telling him something too. I will say that late in my father's life, um, he became very active in a group uh, in the community in Vermont, Norwich, Vermont, where he lived called Bridges for Peace that was involved, this was before the fall of the wall uh, in reconciliation efforts with the Soviet Union. And I, um, I wonder if it has something to do with him in the Ukraine and what he witnessed, um, whether it was the forced starvation, whether it was atrocities that he was aware of. Um, that's one of many things I just don't have an answer to. Um, I too have read Learning from the Germans. Um, it helped shape my, um, my reaction toward modern Germany. Um, Willy Brandt falling to his knees when he visited the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, Steinmeier, the president, some of the comments he made about how this country can only be loved with a broken heart. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Germany and Germans and their attitude toward it because of what happened. Um, they've, all, they've all made a huge impression on me. I'm not sure that um, my dad was even all that engaged in what was going on in Germany that you've described, this, this kind of uh, public mass atonement or the movement for it that you're seeing when these Germans come to Israel. Um, because he, he made it to the States, and I think that might have truncated that process. Um, but he was a, a, a very warm and feeling man. I can vouch for that as having been his son. So um, how far down that road that he was probably avoiding going down, he might have gone down if circumstances had been different, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things I don't know as I mm -hmm. take this story on, but um, as much as you're asking your question of me with, with a sensitivity, I, um, 
and and fielding it with with the same admiration for your sensitivity appreciation for your sensitivity thanks but i just much. don't know thanks a lot appreciate yeah, it thank you i have a comment from marlene who says i can't tell you how much i enjoyed the stories and characters in the book there were so many stories that she could relate to as an immigrant from germany thank you marlene uh derek uh <clears throat> Thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wolf, for uh, your your account. I haven't read the book, but it really is very intriguing. Um, what I have to say is not so much a, a question, but a comment. Um, I think we fathers are a puzzled and a puzzling lot. Uh, when my own father died uh, some 20 odd years ago, uh, I had three days or so waiting for the cremation to take place and I found myself writing my own account of what I knew of my father and I found myself arriving at a conclusion the father I never knew <clears throat> and, I, <clears throat> and I, I wonder really whether we all um, particularly males uh, who go off and, and, and whether they go into the military or whether they go and make a professional career don't relate to their children uh, and the children are perhaps not interested at the time. And then the, the later on in years, uh, one has felt that uh, somehow uh, I missed out. I never talked to my father in the way that I should have done. I never listened to him. Uh, and I, 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 don't, I don't know whether this is just a, a, a peculiarly male um, problem that, that we uh, have to deal with, or whether in fact even the ladies amongst uh, us here on this uh, set uh, often wonder to themselves uh, whether they ever knew their father. Uh, I, I see when you go when one goes through the uh, internet, there are several books already, uh, The Father I Never Knew, or I Never Knew My Father, so I'm not alone in this. Um, but at the same time, um, I think you, you've done a sterling job describing how you came to terms with your own background and the family's background. And I wonder if anybody else um, um, feels like I do, uh, that, that somehow we as fathers uh, didn't relate properly to our children when we should have done. Gloria, there is a, uh, an email that, uh, or a text that I think was, uh, was meant to be directed to Alex that came to me uh, from Ted Pritchard. It said, did you know pers uh, your grandfather personally before he died? What was your relationship with him? He sounds like a very interesting individual who would have been worth knowing. Uh, Alex, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I had one very vivid uh, encounter with, with Court. I was six years old, just old enough to remember it. And uh, I described the interaction in the book, there's also a photo of our, 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 our meeting, there's the two of us. Um, and my, my dad, having been in the war, he was just, he was big on thrift and he wanted to raise me in a, you know, as a responsible young man. And um, had given me this piggy bank that you, you put coins in and you pulled the lever and uh, the bank would only open up when you would save $10 in coins. And Kurt came and visited and he saw this thing and I guess the principal was explained to him and that this was a classic Court Wolf thing to do. He started feeding coins into it until it popped open and delighted me. And who's this guy? I mean, he's, he's completely subverting everything that my dad is trying to do, but I love it. And, <laughs> um, and, and that, was the that was the classic Court thing. But also I now looking back on it, I can see that tension between um, my father and my my grandfather that, that they were just they were forged by entirely different experiences and i that doesn't mean that court didn't go through all sorts of harrowing things i mean to to be a businessman during the weimar inflation must have been horrible to be to see your books burned on the babel plots in berlin in the early 30s um uh the same thing and uh and obviously you know escaping from vichy france um through Spain and Portugal to get to, to the U.S. But um, yeah, he was a, almost my mother more than my father would talk about him, I think, because he did have this, this way of charming women. And 
she had to learn very early on in dating my dad that she needed to put her hand over her wine glass or else it would constantly be filled up because that's what he did. Um, but it's one of the reasons I thought that readers of the book might kindle to him more than to my dad, that, that Kurt was just such a figure, such a larger than life figure. But I think it's my father's, the mysteries of my father, the things that I don't really know um, that abide, that, that are drawing people in. And the immigrant story and, um, you know, all these questions that have piled up since his death that I now wish I could ask him. Um, and I, I suppose that invites circling back to Derek's comment. And if there's anybody who has a theory about this, the reticent father who, who, you know, late in life comes to regret it or whose offspring feel that way, I think you're onto something, um, Derek. I, I, again, I want to be fair to my own father. I don't think he was trying to shut me down. Um, but I do think we're socialized, maybe a little less so these days than once upon a time, that men are socialized to kind of be buttoned up and hold it hold it in. And society doesn't encourage that. And um, I think it's, it's a real shame um, because you're just, you're just raising another generation of men who are liable to be buttoned up too. Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to come back to what um, both Derek and Alex said about fathers. Um, I think we, I think it is incredibly common, especially with, with that generation. Um, you know, we certainly didn't call them the silent generation for nothing. Um, but it also feeds into another comment that I wanted to make, which is that I, I always worry about young people um, and how fast this whole experience, which for all of us on the phone it has scarred us and, and, and formed us for life. Um, you know, people in their twenties today, World War II is 70, 75 years ago and much farther away than World War I was when we were their age. Um, and I, and I, I really do worry that the incredible gray areas that we all agonize over and, and are, are wrestling with to this day and, and the issues of remorse and guilt, those things are gonna fade um, and I just think we, I, I want to thank you, Alex, for, for doing the book and for everyone else who's on the call and, and all the reading and, and everyone's doing and, and talking because we have to make sure that the next generations don't forget this um, and the complexities behind all these discussions. Um, I, I really do worry that some of the things we're dealing with today are because younger people don't understand the risks. That, that exist and have manifest themselves. So this is a, an incredibly important topic. And, and Alex, I just want to thank you for, for putting it out there the way you did and addressing topics that are not easy when they're, when they're in your own family. You know, I think everybody realizes there's stuff in their family that no one wants to talk about, but to address them head on uh, is, a, is a, a gift to everyone else. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kathy. That, that, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I, I suppose my ancestors, for having committed so much to paper, have made this all possible. So it's really their their doing. <laughs> they might regret having having written all this and and saved it all, but um, you know, just I just tried to be curious and as long as possible before passing judgment. Um, you know, ultimately you have to pass some judgment if you're going to collect and tell a story like this, but. Um, tried to engage my imagination enough to see how they were seeing things at the time as much as possible. And, um, you know, you can't be a hundred percent sure of, of anything, but. Um, yeah, I have to say, Alex, that uh, I'm tremendously envious uh, of the treasure trove of uh, correspondence uh, of, of documents uh, that, that you were privy to because having grown up in a family with uh, a similar, although not nearly as distinguished a history, um, I, we have nothing like that. Uh, there are letters, uh, there's some correspondence, but uh, you were able to learn things about your family uh, that are just really quite remarkable because they were such incredible uh, correspondence uh, and, 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 and kept it all. Uh, so it was available to you. That's uh, that's a rare gift. You know, I've, I'm very, very lucky. And of course, my, my heart goes out to tomorrow's biographers who will have to to 
sift through hard drives of emails, I guess, is probably the best they can do. But yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we're very lucky that when we look at that generation that we, who I was anyway, that, and, and archivists, I have enormous appreciation for archivists on both sides of the Atlantic I, I worked with, who seemed to share in the, the thrill of the hunt that, that I was going through. Well, the, the Germans are in a class by themselves in that department. Yeah, and they're, um, you know, the Leo Beck Institute um, for German Jewry. I mean, that's the German German Jewish history to me is just it's just fascinating, and um, uh, there, there is an amazing Jewish history in Germany, and um, and that that has been preserved against all odds. Um, I just want to say. I, I just I said how much I enjoyed the book, but I'm not even sure that Alex can appreciate how much the little vignettes he told in there, you know, remind Steve, Steve is my cousin, remind us of people we knew, you know, as he described some of the situations, there are things that are familiar to us when they go to Vermont and they meet Claude Frank. I mean, that's something that we all sort of grew up with, the Marlboro crowd. And I'm not sure that Alex even appreciates how much for some of us, that these little things resonate in his book, you know, on a totally different level from the high intellectual level that he's pursuing, but on the really sort of basic little story level, but just wonderful. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Marlene. Yeah, that Claude Frank is just, that's one of the examples of way people find their way into the book and um, the music. I mean, I think about the world that Kurt occupied, there was music, there was art, and there was there was books. I don't want to say literature because I think it was the physical object that really got his his heart racing as much as anything. But um, yeah, there the, the I, I I've got to rush down to my equivalent of the North Shire bookstore and find this Louis Manon book um, because it that period that we're talking about between the forties and the sixties, what was going on culturally. Um, that was the world that they emigrated into. And, I'm, um, you know, even I grew up partially in that world and consuming it. It's great stuff. Marianne Pollock asked a question in the chat about the book. And I don't know whether, Marianne, you were asking about um, the Menand book, which is entitled The Free World, or a book that Alex mentioned. Uh, if no, you the book that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, it's, that's right. It's Louis Menand, The Free World. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank Al, Mr. Wolf for the book. I thought it was fantastic. I couldn't put it down, but I had to close it and start again. Also, this might sound very basic, but thank you for including the family tree. I kept referring to it. Some books, because I'm a nonfiction reader, don't have a family tree, and this really helped me understand the book. Also, there were so many SAT words. That's what I call them. I had to have the dictionary right next to me. That was great. And the, the book was wonderful. And my father's been dead 40 years. And I have, even though I feel like I knew him, I, there's so many questions that I didn't ask. Uh, and But the, your book was marvelous. The best book I've read this summer. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I really appreciate the comment. Um, the family tree was something, uh, particularly because there are two Anna Marie's that are very closely related and I didn't want people to be unable to, to disentangle one Anna Marie from the other. Um, that would be too much of an ask uh, of the reader. Um, the book that Bill mentioned that I also read, I, I just wanna make sure people know the title of it. It's called Learning from the Germans by Susan Neiman, N-E-I-M-A-N. -E and she is a woman who is probably best positioned to write a book like that. It essentially, she, she was born in the US, she's Jewish, grew up in the American South from Atlanta, and she's now in Berlin running the Einstein Forum. And she relates what the Germans have done with public memory to what we might do in the American South and in the US at large in terms of, of recognizing Jim Crow and slavery and all that we need to do to, to reconcile that. So uh, another book for your nightstand. We're sending a lot of custom the way of, of the North Shire to the, today. Yes. 
Great. <laughs> if there are no other questions, I think we'll end here. Um, fabulous program. I can't thank you enough, um, both of you, Steve and uh, Alex. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good night. <laughs>